Good afternoon and welcome to NorCal PTAX webinar, which we're putting on in partnership with the Port of San Francisco. This one is how to properly estimate for construction projects. Uh, this is certainly a question that we get a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of questions about, a topic that we get a lot of questions about. So we're happy to bring this two hour webinar to you today. Um, hope you've got some energy reserves because Ed is quite an expert in this field um, and we're really excited to have him. He's our construction and public works specialist. He's going to be giving the main presentation. Uh, I am James Forrest. I uh, actually, I'm, the, I'm a procurement specialist, not a program coordinator anymore, but I am the MC for today. Um, so I'm happy to be here as well. And we're also really thrilled to have Tiffany Tatum as our featured partner from San, uh, the Port of San Francisco today. Tiffany is the Senior Community Development Strategist uh, Specialist, and you're going to hear from her in just a second. I just want to talk real quickly about the hosts, and then we can move right on to the content of the presentation. NorCal PTAC stands for the Northern California Procurement Technical Assistance Center. Yes, it's a long one, uh, so NorCal PTAC, much pithier, we prefer that. Um, we are hosted by the Cal Poly Humboldt Sponsored Programs Foundation up in Humboldt County. And here's our service area on the right. These green counties, these 15 counties in Northern California, uh, represent the counties that we can serve. So if you have a business that's located in one of these counties, you have a primary a significant location in one of these counties, then you can apply for our services. Um, so I'll talk about what our services are in a second. Um, we are funded by a couple different funding sources. We get state, we get federal, and we get local funding. Um, our federal funding comes from the Defense Logistics Agency, uh, and our state funding comes from the Office of GoBiz, California. So that's the governor's office. Um, and all of this means that we're able to provide our services to you at no cost. So we're, we're a, a nonprofit, a 501c3, and uh, we don't charge anything for any of our services. So uh, we're here to help you win government contracts. That's what we do. And in 2021, last year, the last complete year, the clients won more than a half a billion with a B, $500 million in government contracts um, with our help. So we're really happy to be bringing um, these, these dollars, which are tax dollars, to go back into your pocket, into the pockets of the small businesses that are uh, that are paying into the, these tax funds. So it's your tax money, you should get a share of it back when it comes to contracting. So we're really excited to be a part of that project. Um, how do we do it? How do we help these small businesses? Three basic core services um, are what we're founded on. The first is one-on-one -on -one counseling. So procurement specialists such as myself or Ed Duarte can meet with you individually to go over just about any topic related to government contracting. So, uh, you know, if you want to do some market research to see if it's even something good that you need to get into, that you think it's a good idea to get into government contracting, we can do that. Um, we can help develop marketing materials for you, so capability statements. We can help you with your SAM registration. That's a real hot one this year. And all kinds of certifications, socioeconomic certifications, such as WOSB, VOSB, um, of course, the DBE is relevant for construction. Um, so really just about anything, cradle to grave with contracting assistance. Um, we don't help with uh, funding, we don't help with business plans, uh, we don't help nonprofits, so there are some limitations to what we can do. As long as it's related directly to contracting, then we're in. Um, we can also set you up with a custom bid matching profile. What this does is it's a piece of software that goes out on the internet. We set it up with you and then it goes out on the internet and scrapes all the different databases that have procurement data for uh, current publicly available bids. And then based on the criteria you work with your procurement specialist, it'll show you some of them, the ones that are most relevant to your business. So it's kind of something that you can fine tune with your procurement specialist, uh, but the, the end result should be that you wake up every day with an email in your inbox with a list of hyperlinked bids um, that are uh, intended to be uh, matching what your business sells, what kind of product or service you do. Um, so this is something we pay for and then offer to you for free. So a lot of our clients find it really Really helpful. So that's one of our core services. And the last one is kind of uh, self-explanatory because you're all in a training today, but we put on a lot of webinars. Um, we average about one a week. And so uh, we, uh, we have a ton of, that we've already done. If you go to our website, norcalptech.org, under the resources tab, you'll see past webinars. 
Um, and on the, uh, the past webinars, you're going to see dozens and dozens of webinars going back to 2017. It's the last five years of webinars. And we're always coming out with new ones. So you can find the calendar on our website as well. You'll see the PTAC calendar on the homepage. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, move things right along. Oh, just a, just a note, if you're not in this service area, don't stress out too much. Um, there are other PTACs all across the country. In fact, we're just one of 97 uh, resource centers uh, in the PTAC network. So you can find your local PTAC, aptac-us.org. And then now we have uh, Tiffany Tatum, who I mentioned will be talking a little bit about San Francisco Port. So once again, thanks Tiffany so much for joining and you have the floor. Thank you, James. Good evening, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, NorCal P-Tech is such a great organization to work with. I think the custom bid matching alone is enough reason to get connected with them, but they really are about helping businesses get government contracts. So I'm excited to see you all here today. Um, the Port of San Francisco has been working with NorCal P-Tech, I think for almost a year now. And it is always my pleasure to uh, refer small businesses to them because they do not charge. So if there are any um, businesses who are not already connected them, to them, who are newly connecting with them because of this webinar being advertised through the Port of San Francisco, I highly suggest that you reach out to um, one of their consultants and get connected. The contracts that we have listed here are just a few. I'm also going to um, drop a link in the chat for SF City suppliers. And this, you can get um, access to all of city and county of San Francisco's contracting opportunity. So the port is one of the smaller, definitely um, intentional about our engagement with small businesses, but one of the smaller, not the high volume of contracts that the SFPUC might have or the airport or DPW, but we have all the same city practices. And so I highly recommend that you take, um, take down that link I wouldn't say look at it now because you'll be distracted, but definitely copy it and paste it into another browser for another time. Um, you can also go to the ports website, which I'll type in here as well. Um, and each city department will have their own, their own page for their contracting opportunities, but the SF City Partners has everything. Um, I know how important properly estimating is to winning a bid and to really understanding the dynamics, thank you so much, James, to understanding um, and understanding the dynamics of how your bidding is so important so that you don't short yourself, um, that you make sure all of your bases are covered. And so I don't wanna be before you long. Um, I'm gonna put my Calendly link into the chat as well, which allows you to see my schedule and schedule time with me separately if you would like to learn more about the port. Um, I'm happy to meet with you anytime. I'm gonna turn it back. I'm not sure if I'm turning it over to James or Ed, but at any rate, I'm gonna put you back in the very capable hands of the NorCal PTAC staff. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, thanks Tiffany. Uh, and I dropped that link in the chat that, that Tiffany was mentioning, so. All right, great. Um, so now uh, we have the main presentation. So uh, Ed Duarte is, is uh, one of our uh, expert procurement specialists, been working with us for quite a while, and a true expert in his field. Uh, retired uh, contracting, uh, you used to own your own um, contracting business in the Bay Area, so and a whole lot of other things. So Ed, I'll let you introduce yourself and get started here. Thank you, James. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this workshop. Uh, I might mention that uh, it's important to know what can, how this workshop can help you. And if you are an A&E firm, an architect or an engineering company, uh, or a construction management company, or a trucking company. Um, a lot of the information that I'm gonna be talking about will be of relevant, but a lot of it won't. This workshop is designed for the tradespeople, for the construction 
contractors and subcontractors. That's very important because that's where the bulk of the problems lie with the uh, DBE community in learning how to properly estimate. And then if you can secure a contract, in, in the future we would be having workshops on how to project manage and uh, how to build your contract and how to make sure that you could and make some money while you're doing it. So today I'm gonna to be talking about, it's an overview of Caltrans, uh, City of San Francisco, uh, Port of Sacramento, um, BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit, BTA, Alameda County uh, Public Works. The industry, when it comes to uh, public works construction bidding is pretty much done identically. Now that may sound a little unusual to the, you, those of you who are new to the process, but I can assure you after having done this for well, 55 years in my career, our family is a uh, construction company, prime contractor in public works, and we've been doing public works since 1959. Uh, I ran the company business, the, the family company from uh, 86 until I retired five or six years ago. We have always been a prime contractor and obviously that means we have dealt with hundreds and hundreds of subcontractors on all of the different types of projects that we've been bidding. And I can tell you, uh, I'm not exaggerating when the process is virtually identical. So understanding that bid and pricing process and the typical industry standard protocols and methodology, it's, it's vital that you understand how the system works because that's going to increase the probability that you will be a price in a competitive bid and increasing the, the possibility of landing a contract. And again, to reemphasize, this workshop is for the construction contractors. Basic requirements. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on a couple of these early slides because I covered them with the port here a, a, couple of, a couple of months ago. But just as a quick recap, this re these requirements here, um, let me mention, I. I, I a little encounter I had here not too far back where I had a, a minority owner uh, subcontractor. He had, he had attended one of my workshops and, and we did a one-on-one -on -one consultation. And he came back and he was a little bit upset because his comment was, you know, they make us jump through all these hoops. How are we ever gonna get a contra contract? And he was referring to this list. Well, the bad news is the list is what it is, but the good news is it applies to everybody. There is no discrimination here with regard to small business. Uh, Sacramento and the legislature and the California Public Contract Code have passed laws that have put these bullet points into in effect and in place, and they are non-negotiable. That is for every single construction and service type contractor that wants to do business with a public agency, be it the state, the county, the city, water district, school district, the port, et cetera. It applies to everybody and it is uniform for everybody. So you have to have the right license. As a, as a prime, you have to have the, either the A or B. You have to have the right license if, you're, if you are a sub. It's a C category. You all have to, all of us, I say you, we, all have to register with the DIR every year and pay 400 bucks. We're paying that cost for the privilege of bidding these jobs. Every single contract will have insurance coverage requirements, including public liability, property damage, automobile, and obviously workers comp. Prevailing wages are absolutely required for any worker 
working on a job site on a publicly financed public works construction project, period. No variation, no waivers. And in California, the definition of prevailing wages is union scale. Every contractor has to apply and has to comply with the apprenticeship regulations. And those apprenticeship regulations mean that for all the hours worked on a particular project, uh, depending on, on whatever trade category you, you uh, are involved with, 20% of your hours have to be paid to an apprentice. And you can only hire an apprentice from an approved DIR approved apprenticeship program. The pay procedure for every contract is the same. 30 days in arrears. We turn in a, a, an invoice once a month and that particular agency, whether it's San Francisco, whether it's city of San Ramon or Contra Costa County, they have 30 days to pay us. So the immediate impact that that, that means to all of us is that we have to be prepared to front all the costs for labor, equipment, and materials for up to six weeks if we are working, providing any work within that given month. It's, that is a very, uh, that's a very tough barrier for a lot of small contractors. And when you, when you get into the spreadsheet, you're gonna see exactly why. All bid proposals, if your bidding is a prime, must meet without qualification or reservation the specs as written in the bid documents. You don't have any conditional or change the rules. The bid form is provided and the specifications and the contract is actually shown in the bid documents for the prime contractor. So whatever is, is the specifications require the contractor and the subcontractor to build, furnish and build, that is it, black and white. There is no variation there either, no, uh, no waivers of anything. And finally, if your bidding is a prime, all projects over 25,000 will be required to be fully bonded. So you need to, when you're talking about our estimate, we need to take those bonding and insurance requirements as a prime or as a sub, into effect, into, into account. Uh, it means that the pre-bid conference is, is a big deal. You need to, you shouldn't be bidding any job unless you are looking at the site. Uh, union and non-union issues during the bid. Uh, you another fact of life, it's just the way things are, folks. Uh, probably 95 to 98% of the prime contractors that are bidding and building public works projects of any size in California, and especially the Bay Area, they're already signatory union generals. So if they are, and they're on the bidders list as going to planning on bidding that particular project that you're looking at, and you happen to be non-union, you, you need to be aware that if you are the low sub bidder on your particular classification, unless you're willing to sign a union agreement, uh, you will not be awarded the subcontract. Uh, is that discriminatory? Well, it may be, but the union contracts that the general sign with their particular trade, they're bulletproof and they all have a contract clause that says, thou shalt not hire a non-union subcontractor. So it means you'll have to sign a one-time project agreement to become union for that project. And there's other ramifications about that that you need to be aware of, but we don't have time to talk about it in this workshop. We've got a lot of material to cover. And of course, the outreach to subs from the generals, and, but I think just as important, subs should be reaching out to the funds. In those invitations to bid that, that are put out by the primes and, and the bid documents that are 
put out on the street by the owners, by the agencies. They all have this information included. The date, time, and place of where the bids would be turned in, the bonding requirements. The bid proposal form is always included in the specs. I put that in bold red to remind you to, as a subcontractor, read those entire specifications in the parts that apply to you. Division one, general requirements, will have these, these points here, all the, that are shown on the screen. And they all affect you subcontractor. It isn't just for the primes. This will be a, there'll be a brief description of the work, insurance, the DIR requirement. Uh, it'll let you know if there's any project labor agreement in place, any uh, minority DBE, SBE, WE requirements, if any. It'll tell you what the contract completion time and what the penalties are, liquidated damages. The type of CPM schedule they want, that, that'll be turned in by the prime. What are the submittals requirements? Uh, hopefully in the future, we're gonna be doing a project management workshop where we get into the, what are submittals and, and how, do you, how do you handle them and how do you track them? Change order procedures are always detailed to the nth degree in every public works project. And contrary to popular belief out there, you can't make a ton of money on change orders. Uh, I, I won't say you can't make money and I won't say that the biggest contractors have figured out how the system works, but let me tell you, I, have, I can't remember a job that we ever bid where the change order procedure detailed the markup that's allowed by the prime and the sub. And I'm telling you, those markups are nowhere near sufficient to make any money on. Just a little sideline factoid. Weather day allowances will be described. Uh, just because it rains on one day, it doesn't mean the owner will necessarily give you a time extension for your completion deadline, believe it or not. The payout procedure, retention is 5% uh, per the Cal California Public Contract Code, 5% for everybody. There's no variation on that. Every single agency will hold 5% of every month's progress payment until the job is accepted and notice of completion is filed. Safety program requirements will be, will be noted. Swippy plans will be requirement. That's erosion control. It's become very expensive. Uh, quality, QA, QC, materials testing requirements, and project closeout procedures. All of this information affects how you prepare your estimate, and it's all given and shown in the general conditions. So the types of bid proposals, there's, there's really only two that we're gonna worry about today. The first one is lump sum, which is the most common for building type projects. Uh, in looking at Tiffany's um, uh, list of projects that are out to bid, uh, they will probably be lump sum. I'm, I'm, I'm making an assumption there. They could be unit price. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna explain what I'm talking about there. A GMP, a guaranteed maximum price, that's more like in a negotiated contract. TNM, well, I, you will hardly ever find a public works project where they, they allow you to come in at time and materials. And then there's, a, again, going back to design build or, or, or negotiated private projects, it would be cost plus percentage for overhead profit or your markup or cost plus a fixed price, which is a fee. But the unit price format, which is the typical Caltrans and other heavy civil type construction projects, that's the one we're gonna talk about in detail. And we will also talk a little bit about the lump sum. But the unit price format is the one that's used by Bay Area Rapid Transit, Alameda County Public Works, VTA, um, just about everybody. So every estimate 
needs to cover that uh, preliminary bidding estimating considerations that I just described, uh, incorporate the project information and your notes from the pre-bid job walk. And you're gonna be estimating labor and equipment costs, materials and subcontract costs, job site overhead expense, and then you recap it all, bring it up to contingency and mark up the, the, the final number to get your final price ready. So best practices, well, obviously start your own estimate early. Your pre-bid job walk, your takeoffs, quantity takers, and develop your spreadsheet at least a week before the project bids. I would suggest two weeks, but everybody has a different discipline habit. So I'm just telling you what I recommend. Again, um, I'm not bragging about this. I'm simply telling you that at my age and having been in the business for so long, I can tell you unequivocally that all of my peers, my friends who own prime construction companies and my friends who are subcontractors, the ones who have the experience in bidding public works, these are the practices we follow. This is the way we do it. So if you're not doing it this way, um, I suggest you learn how. Format your spreadsheet to mimic the prime's bid form as required by the owner for your subs. Send out your own request for bids for your, from your suppliers and subs. And, and at this point in time, you're gonna send in your unpriced scope letter to the bidding primes. Now I talked about scope letters in that first workshop I did. And I will show you one example when we open up the documents that are our sample handouts, okay? So when it comes to the bonding and insurance, uh, these requirements, they're always included in the bid documents. So the cost should be in your bid. So they shouldn't be a concern of yours as regarding the cost. And that let, let me let me expand on that for a moment. I hear a lot of complaints from um, attendees to my workshops, and they talk about the bonding and the insurance. They say, "Well, you know, we can't afford all that." If you're going to be bidding on public works, and in fact, I'll go so far as to say, if you're bidding private work and you're not already carrying it, the right liability insurance and workers' comp, you're not bidding as a legitimate contractor. You sure as heck are not going to be able to operate that way if you're going to come after public works. So that's non-negotiable. Insurance is a fact of life. And in California, you don't want to be without it when you're doing these, these kind of projects because, number one, the agency and the prime won't even let you set foot on the job site. But the cost of the insurance is going to be in your bid. It's not something that you're gonna come up with, have to pay up later. It should be in your bid. Same thing with the cost of the bonds. In fact, bonds are never paid, should never be paid for by the contractor, prime or sub. What do I mean by that? It's in the bid. The last thing I do when I total up my bid at the very bottom line is I add the cost of a bond because my, that bond premium is going to be based on my total contract award price. So if I, if I happen to be low bidder and I get the job, that, that bond premium, it's, it's my first expense that I submit on my first pay application. Progress payment number one, mobilization. Well, that includes the bonds. So and I'll, I'll show you how we, 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 we can take care of that, but don't let, don't let the cost of the bond throw you. Uh, qualifying for bonding, that's a whole different, that's a whole different subject because the bonding I'm talking about is not the licensed bond that you have on file up in Sacramento for $15,000. Securing a line of bonding will take at least 30 days to get qualified if you qualify, because getting bonding is a function of uh, cash in the bank, net worth, and uh, disposable assets. 
it's, I, and again, I, I, I'm going to get off track if I start defining bonding, but it is a subject that the folks need to be aware of how it works. As far as a prime, for those of you who are going to bid as a prime, uh, you have to you have to have that bonding, and you have to bond because every single agent uh, agency in California, from the state on down will require the prime contractor to post performance and payment bonds. Now, since the early teens of 2000, say 2010, 11, 12, bonding of subcontractors has become more prevalent in the industry because of the high risk and the high probability that we subcontractors fail during the the course of construction. Um, that's really too bad, but it's it's a question of uh, risk mitigation and bonding bonding of subcontractors by prime contractors. You have to remember it is at the sole discretion of the prime, and if they ask you to furnish a bond after accepting your price and you can't furnish a bond, they have every right to pick another subcontractor. It's in the con contract code. There's a methodology for the primes to substitute out a prime, a subcontractor if they're not bondable. Just another hard fact of life. And insurance specs, as I said before, they apply down line to the subs in the same context as to the prime, and a prime cannot waive any insurance specs for the sub. All of these map points really matter as you're putting your spreadsheet together. So what is job site overhead? Well, job site, I'm not talking about your office overhead. I'm talking about what it takes to run a project. If you are a prime contractor, you have expenses that include supervision and other project requirements, like maybe a, a project engineer, a safety officer, you have cost of temporary fencing, a job trailer, toilets, drinking water, erosion control, permits, inspections, vehicles, et cetera. These costs can run anywhere from six to 10% of the cost of the bid, depending on the size of the contract. Job site overhead is a real and valid job site cost. It is not office overhead. Therefore, job site overhead has to be a part of your spreadsheet and a part of your bid. If you are a subcontractor, these first two bullet points, all of those uh, requirements, you probably will have, won't have very many of them, but you will have some of them. And you need to account for those costs because you should not be trying to cover them in your, uh, in your markup. And just a, a, another emphasis on a reminder that Safety programs cost money and they will be mandatory. And even though COVID is kind of dwindling as far as contractual requirements, uh, safety programs have always been uh, a big deal in public works construction and they're gonna be a bigger deal. And those programs uh, can cost money. So you need to put money in for that. Here's where the word estimate really comes into play, and that's labor costs. So for openers, every contractor should be aware of what their total cost per hour is for the trades that they employ. And that goes for the prime and, and the sub, they're all the same. Uh, always consider the proposed schedule of the contract in case your work goes into another pay raise category. Remember I told you in the prevailing wages, they're defined by the DIR, and the DIR is nothing more, that database is nothing more than a rubber stamp of the construction trade union, the AFL-CIO construction trade union agreements. And those agreements have uh, time limits. They usually, after every 12 months, there will be a pay raise. And then at the end of a three-year contract, they will go into negotiation and either go on strike or they will 
sign another contract with the raises. And every time, once you become signatory, every time there's a pay raise under the, con under the union contract, you have to start paying it to your folks. So when you're bidding a job that takes two years for time and you're working in both those years, you need to consider, remember that the labor costs that you're incurring in the second year are gonna be subject to a higher rate. Again, it's just so critical. And with California labor regs and union contracts, most often a partial day work warrants a full day's pay, show up for minimum time. And multitasking requires multiple pay rates. That's usually prohibited. Material costs. Here's another area where contractors of every color, race, breed, and gender, everybody makes can make a mistake on this because the very first thing that can happen, especially in the, in the era we are living in right now with the supply chain delays, and that is cost of materials. Be sure material quotes, first of all, that the material is, uh, is approved for use in the project. The specifications are gonna be absolutely explicit as to what is approved. So uh, that's where the submittal process comes in. So you always include the tax and freight to the job site. If you have to unload the, those material, like say rebar, uh, you need to have a crane there to unload it. So that cost has to be part of your cost or you have to ask the prime to unload it for you. Either way, it's gonna cost somebody something. More important, be sure the supplier can deliver the material or equipment within the scheduled contract time. Because once I as a prime sign the contract and you as a sub sign my subcontract that I give you, we're both on the hook for the, for the contract time. And if, the, and if the material gets delayed, yeah, we can go on bended knees and ask for a time extension, but that doesn't mean the agency owner will automatically grant that. And if we can't finish on time because some of our equipment and materials didn't get there on time within our schedule, uh, we could be facing liquidated damages. So get a commitment in writing for the, for the supplier for price protection and compliance with the specifications. And if it's not possible to get a, 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 a guarantee, get an estimate on a possible cost increase in user. Well, what the heck do I mean by that? You know, an electrician will tell me, well, for, you know, Ed, the people who are supplying the copper wire tell me that the price goes up every 30 days. And I said, well, I said, I know, I, 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 I hear your pain. I feel your pain, but the agency we're bidding to really could care less. It's the old classic phrase they'll tell me, that's your problem. So what do we do? Well, what we do, is we'll call that supplier up for something we're gonna be buying during the next, uh, you know, as soon as the contract award is, is given to us. And we'll say, well, what about this lumber? You're telling me there's a price increase coming. How much is it gonna be? I don't know, Ed. It could be 10%, it could be 20%, it could be 30%. I said, well, give me a ballpark. Well, we've been seeing 7% every six months. Okay, so if I buy that stuff right away, I better be prepared for 7%. I'm gonna tax 7% on the quote he gives me. And that's the number I'm gonna use because I need to have some kind of protection for a possible cost increase. You will not get a change order if the price of your equipment materials go up. End of discussion. And get familiar with the famous print payment terms, because there are no deposits, there's no upfront money from the owner, and you're sure not gonna get any upfront money from me. I'm not a bank. And finally, always use a purchase agreement for anything that's of substantial cost. We use a, a, a threshold of about 
anything, any equipment we're going to buy, generator, compressors, any piece of equipment that I have to buy to furnish and install on the job. If it costs more than 10000 I'm writing a materials subcontract. It is not going to be a, a standard short form PO. Give me one generator model K47 for $12,000. That's not going to cut it because we have to turn in the submittal to the engineer who has to approve the generator that we are proposing to furnish. And that'll include the, the submittal documents that have to be submitted and approved, the performance specifications, um, everything regarding that thing will be specifically spelled out in the specifications. So we have to hold our suppliers to the same level of accountability that we are held. I think that's the best way to put it. As far as the admin costs on a project, well, be aware that uh, project management costs can be substantial, especially for you that are bidding at primes. And for you subs that, that you get into larger subcontracts, you, you will definitely have superintendent or project management expense. And if if it's a transportation project like a Caltrans or a VTA or a BART project, the liability insurance limits can be substantially higher, especially if they're building next to the railroads. The railroads typically require $10 million of coverage. Well, don't panic. All you do is call your broker and say, hey, I know I've got my standard policy for two or $5 million for the coverage, but this job I wanna bid is requiring 10 million liability. And by the way, it's gonna apply for all of us. Nobody gets a pass on this. So you just tell the broker, I need a quote for, for a, a, what we call an insurance writer. And that writer will be a supplemental insurance document that ups the limits to 10 million during the time that we are on site working. And they'll give you a quote for that writer, and it's good for one year. So if you have to keep it for two years, multiply times two, and put that in your bid. There's it's no need to get panicky about it. That's, I, I mention that because I, I hear that all the time from the smaller contractors. They say, how the heck can I afford a $10 million liability fund? You don't have to. You're not going to buy it. Until unless you get the job, number one. And when you do get the job, you better have the quote for the writer in your estimate. Certified payrolls have to be weekly for open shop subs. Just a reminder, if you happen to wind up on a job where you are not having to become a, a union signatory, but you are going to be failing, paying prevailing wage, you will have to pay the entire prevailing wage package which includes the cost of the benefits as one hourly rate. This is for those of you who do not have approved health and pension plans. So let me stop there for a second and see if we have any questions. All right. Um, we do have some questions. Uh, Nisha is asking, I don't always see completion times or liquidated damages on these contracts when I peruse through them, does that signify a problem or just a question for the procurement officer? Well, I, I've i never seen a project advertised that didn't have a time limit. I, I don't know where you're looking and I don't know what kind of jobs you're looking at, but on a public works project in the general conditions, division one of the specifications, they absolutely have to. It's for their benefit. They want to. They want to tell the contractor, "We want this job finished by a certain amount of time, and if you don't finish, we're going to charge you a thousand dollars a day, two thousand dollars a day, three thousand dollars a day, whatever." So I, 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 I don't know how to answer the question other than to say that it's it should always be there. Okay. Um. Nisha is also asking uh, pay application procedure. Can you speak a little more about that 
let's say you're on the site for that 30 day period and you are turning in an invoice that totals up for your work for that month, $50,000, $100,000. That's your invoice to the prime. And assuming your amount is approved by the owner, when the owner pays the prime, they will pay $95,000 of that $100,000. And you will, your check will be for $95,000. It will never be for the full amount. Every sub will have retention withheld by every prime. And however, it is limited to 5%. So if you are, any of you folks are on a public works project right now, and you are a subcontractor and you are going through the, this process that I'm describing, and you've got a prime who's holding 10% on you, that's illegal. And that's not per the public contract code. So I would stand up and squawk. Uh, Pamela is asking, what if our company has a medical plan for employees and a retirement plan? Do we still need to pay the union wages benefit package? You have to pay the equivalent amount. Let, let, let's say your union package, I'm going to just pick a number. It's $5 an hour. And your retirement is, uh, is $10 an hour. Um, then you pay that to your, on the behalf of your employee. And then the balance of the, of the benefits as defined by the DIR union template has to be given to your worker. All right. Yes, you can pay into your own programs if they're approved, they have to be approved. And, um, but the total dollar value of the benefits and the wage has to equal the DIR template. I'm gonna show you what that looks like when I do the documents. Great. All right, we don't have any more questions at this time, but just know that there'll be there'll be uh, another question time. So if you have them, please put them in the Q&A tab. Okay, moving on. So unless you're buying estimating software, use Excel. Let, let me expand on that for a minute. As you all know, <laughs> I've been around a long time, so Call me a dinosaur. Interestingly enough, I see today's generation all wanting to do everything by their phone or their iPad and absolutely with some kind of an app. That's all well and good. But I'm, let me tell you, I, I, don't, I don't think I know of maybe five general contractors who are not using Excel. It, the benefit of Excel is that you create a custom spreadsheet that fits the way you like to operate your company and how you like to prepare your bids. I, I can tell you that SJ Amoroso, which does over 500 million a year, uses Excel. McCarthy, uses Excel, Hensel Felt uses Excel, I use Excel. Uh, I don't see the need for paying for estimating software when you can develop a spreadsheet that fits you and is so much simpler to, to use and it costs you nothing. So that's my pitch for Excel. Set up each segment to match the list of bid items, you're gonna cover five basic components. They're all the same for every type of contractor. The labor, which would be the in-house or self-performed labor, tools and equipment, materials, subs, and jobs out over it. It's the same for all of us. The categories are all always these and the input on, on what's inside of these five is what only is the only part that varies from company to company, contractor to contractor. 
So you set up the spreadsheet as a to-do list. Every line item should be a description of a task entry. Uh, this, the attached sample spreadsheet will show you the column headings. And we're, we're going to open that up and take a look at it. I, uh, I believe in marking up the job at the end. Uh, and you can do it whatever way you want, especially with Excel. You can make it fit the way you like to mentally see the estimate. But most generals, we like to er enter all of our costs at direct cost. And then we mark up the entire job, we mark up the grand total. So there's two types of bids, the Caltrans method, which your price is for a defined unit, such as a square foot, linear foot, cubic yard, square yard, ton, et cetera. And the bid proposal will have an estimated quantity. That's your typical road jobs, your heavy civil projects, your uh, rapid transit projects, uh, some of your um, uh, water and wastewater projects. And the lump sum cost, you will see that more often with the pure, what I call pure building projects. And, um, and they are two different types of spreadsheets. So again, a recap on typical cost for job site overhead. And you're all going to get a copy of these slides. And in unit pricing, we have to have a definition of the pay quantity, determining our overhead costs, and determining labor and equipment costs, the spreadsheet format, distribution and cost of general conditions, quantity takeoffs, bundling and breakout of bid items. I'm going to go over that as we get into the spreadsheet. I am assuming that for those of you who are construction contractors, you know the term takeoff. But if you don't, the term takeoff refers to the process of calculating the quantities of materials needed to build the project. In other words, when I say, have you finished your lumber takeoff yet? Means have you gone to the drawings and looked at the, uh, at the framing plans and counted up every single two by four, two by six, four by eight uh, beam, six by six posts, et cetera. Have you accounted for them all? Or have you had the lumber company do it? Because if you are guesstimating on quantities, then I'm not surprised you're having trouble landing projects because you're always going to be too conservative. That means you're going to be overpriced. You're not going to be competitive, and your bid proposal is going to go in the wastebasket. You need to do material takeoff. That's the math part, and it requires discipline and patience. And if you're not going to do that, you're not going to make it in this business. Period. So you need to know how to do that. There's two ways. Actually, they have to be done together. The old fashioned way is math. We measure, count, and calculate. How many square feet uh, in, the, in the floor? So I, I need to, for, for you that are flooring contractors, you need, to, you need to calculate the number of square yards of carpet or vinyl tile or ceramic tile. Um, you have to do that by you know, length times width equals area and then get quotes for, from the uh, carpet supplier. And they're gonna wanna know, well, how much? How much are you gonna order? Well, you do a calculation on the square footage of the floor area, I'll make an allowance for waste. And that's what you're gonna put into your bid. You should never be guessing on, on, when it comes to materials. There is software programs, Bluebeam, is one that I recommend. We use that. And it is, a, it is an adaptation of what I just described, but you, you simply use the mouse and put the cursor on the four corners of the building and click, and out comes a square foot each. It's the lazy way of doing it, but it sure speeds things up. However, you better hope to heck that your 
blue beam never uh, takes a dive on you because for those of you who can't calculate material on a basic math uh, process, I feel for you because we're not talking calculus, we're not talking trig, we're not talking advanced quantum theory, we're simply talking addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Rapidly being a lost art. Crew rates, we're gonna be using crew rates as we develop the spreadsheet. And here's a sample. What do I mean by a crew rate? Well, let's say you're a framing sub and you're gonna bid on this project and you wanna price it out. You wanna, you wanna estimate your labor based on your crew size. And your crew consists of a foreman, two carpenter journeymen, one apprentice and two laborers. Well, at the DIR rates and the total cost per hour that I'm gonna show you in a moment, those people would look like something like this, $90 an hour for the foreman, 85 each for the carpenters for a total of 170, $50 per hour for the apprentice and two laborers for 130. So if these numbers here that I'm, that I'm showing you, and please note that they're sample rates, they're purposely low. So don't go, any of you are framers out there, don't go using this on a public workshop. They're only about seven years out of date. But for purposes of, of example, that means that the total cost per hour for the framing crew is $440. So for a 40 hour week, that's $17,600. What does that figure represent? That represents what you as the framing contractor will be paying out for those six people working one week. That's not the cost of their labor that, that their paychecks are gonna be obviously somewhat smaller. But these amounts are the total amounts you're gonna be paying to them, to the unions for the fringe benefits, to the payroll tax and insurance, to the workers' comp, to the IRS, and to the state. You will incur every single penny of that $440 an hour. So when we do our estimate and we say, uh, okay, I'm gonna turn in a bid on this little building and uh, it's all wood frame. And my, my proposal to the prime is to, once the slab is poured, I'm gonna put down my sill plate and then start standing up my walls, do my sheathing, my fire blocking, add my trusses and put on the roof plywood and turn it over to the prime and say, okay, here's the building frame. I'm done with my bid proposal. I'm, I've just framed the building for you. Okay, so my quote to him should include the number of weeks that I think we can do it. So let's say I pick four. So four times 17 is $72,000. Four times 17, six. Um, what happens if we take five weeks to frame that building? I just lost $17,600 off my bottom line. What happens if I finish three days early? I'm gonna pick up about $15,000. Labor is our only place in our bid proposal where the word estimate applies. What we are saying is that I think my crew composed of X people can do the allotted work in this amount of time. And that's how I'm pricing the job. The material cost is the material cost. The equipment cost is the, I can get, equip, I can get equipment rental rates for a forklift, for a man lift, uh, for, for nails, for my uh, pneumatic guns. All those numbers are easily 
obtainable to a very close degree of accuracy. But my labor cost is based on productivity, what I think my folks can do. So it's really important that you know what your, what your folks are costing you. Again, you're going to see this in the spreadsheet. So for follow-up, we're going to develop standard estimating checklists or forms, make our forms consistent with the way we record job costs, debrief on successful and unsuccessful bids, and maintain files on all successful and unsuccessful bids. So to close it out, start our estimate early. If you're a sub, contact the bidding primes with your scope letter, unpriced. Contact your suppliers, confirm coverage. Double check your quantities and your labor rates. Double check your spreadsheet for errors. Finalize your number and then send your priced out scope letter on, on bid day about an hour, hour and a half early. And remember that estimating is 50% math and 50% acquired skill. I'm trying to cover information that in my, my estimating class that I taught at Cal State Hayward, it was 30 hours of instruction. And we're trying to do this in 70 minutes. Um, it's an overview, folks. And um, we do the best we can with the time we have. Finally, on bid day, finalize your price, send it in. The next day, contact the low bidder and request results for your work. If they used your number and listed you, send a short note. Congratulations. And you can find the bid results on the owner's website. It's public information. So let me go back for a second here. Take a second set of questions, and then we're going to dive into the examples that I have for you. Okay, let's take a look here. Uh, we don't have any more questions in the Q&A. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I see a couple folks have raised their hands. Uh, I'm not sure if that's intentional or not. Um, if you could put your question in the Q&A, uh, type it into the Q&A tab, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll present it to Ed. Not seeing any other questions at this point. Okay. Or are we going to do one more uh, Q and A at the end? Ed? Oh yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Do I now? Do I hit click on the new share? Uh, you, you want to switch to the documents? Ed. Yes, I do. Okay. Press escape on your keyboard. All right. Now select from the bottom tray. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yeah, that's helpful. Okay. So this, here's a typical list of bid items. I picked one from a small Caltrans project. So here's the bid items I keep referring to that, that the prime is going to have to have to uh, deal with self descript self descript uh, self descriptive so when i talk about um, separating bidding as the prime for example let's say this is a small job and you're an asphalt grading and paving contractor. Well, you're going to be you're going to be probably bidding items 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So if you are going to provide a bid on that asphalt of those items and you can do all of those 
you have to give the prime unit prices on each one. So your, your spreadsheet uh, or your scope letter is going to have to reflect those items that I just listed. Conversely, let's say you're, um, let's say you are a, um, an underground contractor. And you're going to bid on item 26 of corrugated steel pipe. The plastic, six inch plastic pipe, number 28. Uh, the under drain pipe, non perforated, the corrugated steel pipe down drain, and a corrugated 12 inch down drain, an eight inch taper, a 12 inch taper, an eight inch anchor assembly. The engineers have always done this for hundreds of <laughs> decades, and they give you the, uh, the uh, description the breakout, and then they also, if you notice in the far right hand time, uh, right hand uh, column, they give you the estimated quantity. So how does that equate to the bid proposal? Well, it looks like this. Oh, I don't have one, sorry. Uh, the bid proposal form will have these same items all in one continuous list with a place to enter a unit price and an extension. So one of the problems that primes have with inexperienced subcontractors is that, let's say that underground contractor, he gives them a lump sum price for all those items. That doesn't, that doesn't do him any good because he's got to give individual prices. And your price as a lump sum might look reasonable, but I have no way of breaking it up into those seven categories unless you tell me. So it's just crucial that you that you follow the prime contractor's bid proposal format. Now, coming over to what I talked about, true labor costs. This is a sample breakdown of how to calculate what uh, what your true your true cost of labor? So again, this is just an example, folks. Just don't take this as gospel. It's strictly a sample. So if the hourly wage is twenty five dollars, twenty twenty five dollars, the green column, the green items, they're the same for every company in California, construction or otherwise. We all have to have as employers. We have to pay Social Security tax, half of it. The other half is taken out of the employee paycheck. Same thing with the Medicare. But we have to pay the unemployment tax, the state unemployment tax. We have to pay for workers' comp, and we have to pay for PLPD, the public liability and property damage. In our company, we equate these, these two yellow ones to um, a value that is uh, equated and ap applied as an hourly rate. So over here in the notes, if you take a look at them, the wage rate is the hourly rate that the DIR will have. The percentages in green are fixed by state law. The insurance rates in yellow, or you get that from your broker. And the benefit categories, they will be listed on the DIR prevailing wage tables. So there's no guess, there's no guesswork here as to uh, what your people are costing you. So that's a sample template. And it's an Excel spreadsheet. And I'll be happy to send the original template to anybody who wishes a copy. But let's keep moving forward. So what does that look like when we put it back to the real world? Well, clear back in 2018, the labor was getting 30, 54 an hour. There's the payroll, what I call the payroll taxes, all these. And there's the union de definition of benefits and pension, other and training and vacation. So there's benefits of almost 32 bucks an hour. So that labor 
who's getting $30.54 an hour is costing me $62 an hour. And this yellow number is the number you need to enter on your spreadsheet because mark my word, you will be paying every penny of these costs. Because if you don't pay them on time, you will be audited by the state, by the unions, by IRS, and they'll catch it. And you'll be paying these again with penalties. So when you're doing your labor estimate, like I showed you in those crew rates, these are the numbers that we have to start with. And mind you, these numbers are four years old now. Here's a carpenter. In 2018, they were getting $42 an hour and it's paid in $3.09. I just did a, uh, an update on the carpenters using the DIR rate for August of 2022. And this cost is $112 an hour now. We're talking huge dollars folks. And you have to use these numbers when preparing your labor portion of your estimate. Here's one for the cement masons. They're at 70. They're probably at 90, 90 plus dollars an hour. So I, I'm showing those to you as an example of what, uh, how quickly you can get out of whack and go in the hole on a project when you say, my five person crew will do this work in four weeks. And then you finish two days later, the dollar cost overrun, it just, it's, it's horrendous. So your estimates have to be accurate. Here's an operating engineer. And again, these are samples and these are all out of date. I did that on purpose. So you would not use them. Here's a sample of, a, of some of the things I've talked about that is in the uh, invitation to bid. This is the, the flyer that's put out by the, the prime contractor. This is for a job up at Folsom Dam, a control structure project. Kiwit was, the, was, the, was gonna bid on it. And a request for subcontractor or sub supplier quotes from qualified small businesses. And there's all the categories they are looking for. We're looking for sub and supplier bids. Uh, and then they describe the project. And then they describe the NACE codes. And then they tell you what are the categories that they're looking at. Aggregates, trucking, bulkhead, goist equipment, concrete supply and pumping, drilling, blasting, dewatering, and the swippy plan, shoring, piles, surveying, hydro seeding, fuel, HVAC, et cetera. So lots of opportunity. And then they get to the, the specifics. We would prefer subs to bid by items in their entire, entirely, entirety, but if you're limited by bonding capacity or resources, we can break down items into smaller units. That's easier said than done, but they're willing, they're willing to put it in writing. So if that is of an advantage to you as a, as a smaller sub, uh, take advantage of it. Note that bid is due at one o'clock, but we want the bids on Monday, August 30th. If you will be quoting as a sub or material supplier and are not familiar with our standards of contract, contact them and they'll send you a copy. We require that our subs and suppliers furnish a performance and a payment for supply bond in an amount equal to 100% of the price. And they will pay for the premium up to 2%. So just like I said before, if you have the amount of the, if you are bondable and you just tell them, uh, my bonding rate is 
they'll they'll they will add two percent to your bid, and they'll give you a contract for that amount so that you can pay the premium, or they'll pay it direct either way. The important point is here is they're saying we require that you will have to furnish a bond. So they're bonding all subs. And what are we talking about when we talk about scope letters? Well, here's a good scope letter. Here's the company. Here's all the certifications. Here's the, the bidding to the a painting contractor doing a, a multi-building high rise. We're going to do the bidding section um, spec section 79200 joint ceilings they're going to caulk every window in the mission rock tower building a and the annex building here's their inclusions here's the description of the work this happens to be a private job total number of windows to be sealed 1000 units Exclusions, all specifications aren't listed above. General terms and conditions, proposal good for 30 days. Proposal shall be incorporated, this proposal shall be incorporated as an exhibit to every subcontract agreement. I point this out to you just to, to make you aware of the, of the probability that no prime contractor will ever do that. I don't do it, I don't know any of my prime competitors and friends, we can't incorporate your, your scope letter as an exhibit because it, it contains, it could contain um, paragraph language that I can't live with. And I don't sign your subcontract proposal, you sign my subcontract agreement. That's the way it works in the industry. Every prime does the same thing that I'm uh, that I'm describing. Okay, so those are some samples there. We have any questions on that right now? On that, that those documents. We're going to go into the spreadsheet next. Once again, folks can feel free to put their questions into the Q and A tab, but I don't see anything right now. Ed. Okay. This is that spreadsheet I was telling you about. That it's a template, and when you if, if you wish to use it, um, it it works for everybody, and it's very simple, and it's in Excel, and it's not proprietary. Uh, every contractor that I know has a similar. One. Most of them built it themselves, but they essentially all cover the same material. All right, so this is the spreadsheet for, oops, too much. Okay, when I talk about general conditions, which in essence is job site overhead, here's a, a small example of what a prime contractor would incur on a, on a given project. We're gonna go through a sample spreadsheet here that is a very small project. I've got 12 weeks, in other words, three months of supervision. And uh, if my, the column headings are the work unit would be WK would week, MO month, LS lump sum, each, et cetera. The unit cost is where we would do a manual entry here. The takeoff quantity, here's where you do your calculations. 
And then these are the extensions. In-house labor goes here. Materials and equipment go here. Subcontractors go here. And uh, totals kick out over at the far right. And over here, we put in our notes to help remind us what it is we're talking about. So this spreadsheet is a clean, simple, small version that any contractor can set up and, and you can customize it to fit the way you like to do it. But the important part is that for those of you who are primes, this expense, these items, are the cost of running and maintaining the job site. We haven't pounded a single nail or put a shovel in the ground or poured any concrete, nothing. We just, this is, this is what it costs to run the job. And on this example, we're showing a $66,000 expense. And then the bid items that the prime has to follow we have a bid item one of mobilization and demo. Two is hot mix asphalt. Three is structure backfill. Four is the concrete sidewalk. And five is electric light poles. This is a made up example. I tried to keep it small and simple so that you have a, the ability to, to get the concept of what we're talking about. And when I say set up the project, set up the bid item or, or your scope of work as a to-do list, this is what I'm talking about. So let's say I'm a dirt guy and I'm gonna quote to the prime structure backfill. So I need to rent a loader. I need to operate the loader. I need to buy black backfill material. I need to place a compact backfill material. I need a couple of whackers and a vibratory plate. I need to install a subdrain. I need to buy the material for the subdrain. And I need a water truck. Okay, I'm just using a very short abbreviated to-do list. So for that particular bid item, if I go to the specs, they will have a definition under bid item three, structure backup, and they'll tell you what this covers. And it says it covers the labor and equipment and material effort the contractor has to, has to expend to backfill around the concrete structure. And here's where we enter our all right, so let's say that loader rental is costing me $15 an hour and I need two days to do it, 16 hours. So I have $800 worth of loader rental. I have an operator who's $85 an hour from that chart and he's gonna operate it for two days, eight, 16 hours. So my labor cost is $1,360. Again, all these go over to the far right. I have to purchase the material by the key. I buy it by the cubic yard and I need six yards of it. I'm sorry, I'm paying $6 a yard and there's 600 yards of it. So there's $3,600 worth of expense. Three laborers at $65 an hour. Um, three times 65 should have been 195. Let's put that in, let's say 195. And it kicks out my labor cost. So that's a crew hour rate of $195 an hour, three labors at 65 and 16 hours, two days. And there's my labor cost. A lump sum rental cost, I get a quote from the equipment company and they say, 
yeah, we'll, we'll give you the whackers and stuff for a couple of days for 600 bucks. So that goes in the equipment problem. Install the sub drain, two laborers for four hours, they can do the drain. $520 worth of labor. Uh, sub drain material, I got a quote from the um, supply company. It's $650 for the corrugated pipe. And then I have a, a water truck rental that tells me they say we want $125 a day for two days, $250 a day for, for equipment rental. I just gave you a very simplified to-do list. Or if you want to say, what I used to say in my classes, what do I have to do to furnish and install structure backfill? So I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm literally walking in my mind. What, what are we, what's the, what are the, what is the crew going to be doing out there? And what do they need to do it? So that's the concept that if every subcontractor, every contractor learns how to do this, you will figure this out very quickly and you'll be able to do your to-do list if you, if you want to call it that. Sequence of events, sequence of tasks, but whatever it is you have to do to, to, to accomplish your work, this is how you describe it. And this is how you quantify it and cost it out. So if you add those three columns up, and they're $10,900, and I want to put a markup of 25%. So my bid would be 13,625 for this very small little 600 yard structure backfill bid item. It's not a complicated process. Obviously, as the project grows and gets bigger, it's, the spreadsheet becomes a lot more complicated. This is not a, this is just an example to get, show you the concept. Now, forget this little part here for the moment. And let's say that it is a heavy civil job with bid items. So we have $66,000 of job site costs. Now we're thinking like a prime, okay? And now I'm gonna show you a prime example. So as a prime, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend 28 grand on supervision and $1,500 for the pickup and $3,000 for fuel and uh, $2,500 for a safety program, et cetera. And I'm gonna put in $10,000 contingency because I didn't like what I saw out of the job site. There's some things that are bugging me. And so I'm gonna put in a what if factor, a fudge factor, we call it project contingency. So I'm gonna throw in 10 grand, just for sake of example. So that, that brings my cost to 6450. My MOVE and DMO, I've, I've defined them as, it takes me 15 grand to move in and move up, 15 grand to move off. My asphalt, I've got a quote from Granite. He's going to give me a sub bid, 15245. We've got the, the backfill priced out. My concrete sub is doing this, did the same thing and priced it all out and came up with this number, $30,000. And then the electrician did the same thing and came up with a price of $32,000. So, what am I going to do with all this? I'm not because uh, I'm now I'm bidding as a prime. Well, I have to go to my recap sheet. And I recreate my bid proposal form because this is what my bid runner is going to fill out when they're sitting in the lobby of the public works department with a clipboard and the manila envelope with all of my bid forms and the bid proposal form that has these items 
they have to write down the numbers I'm going to give them. So, no, I'm not going to show them all this. That's in house, that's me. But the spreadsheet goes back and grabs all of the costs back in the estimate. It's grabbing these costs like, like this one, the 30,000. 455 or the 32.1. So if you go over to the other tab on the recap sheet, Ed, we can't, you're, you're on mute, we can't hear there, yeah. Somehow that got pressed by mistake. Okay, so there's my 30,000, there's my 15, there's my 10, there's my 30,455, and there's my 32,160. Now remember, there's no bid item for general conditions. <clears throat> none, none of the heavy civil projects and building projects, nobody has a category for, for job site overhead. They should, but they don't. So we as the contractor have to figure out where am I gonna put that cost? Because it's a real cost. So we figured out a way to do it years ago. All the primes do this. So we grab it and we put it here in E4. And then we distribute it manually. So with MOB and DMOB, I have very minimal costs. I'm just gonna put 4% there and I'm gonna put the remaining 96% divided by four items at 24% each. And I'm distributing that cost among the other four bid items. So the spreadsheet takes the base cost times 4% of the green E4 and kicks out 2658. There's the same thing for bid item two, item three, item four, item five. Again, it's multiplying the percentage rate times that rate, the GC cost, general conditions. So that's why the numbers are all the same for bid items two through five. So down at the bottom, I see that I have now picked up and accounted for all of my general conditions. Then I do a subtotal. Now I put, how much do I want to make on the job? I pick 25%, I just for sake of argument. So I take 25% times each one of these. And I, I get this. 8,000, 7,000, 6,000, 11,000, 12,000. So my total markup is $46,000 so far. And subtotal again. So now my, my running total is now at 231, but I'm not done because I'm a prime and this is a public works job and they want a bond. And you add the bond cost at the very end. So I added, I put a bond of two and a half percent. This is an example. So two and a half percent times this equals a thousand dollars, equals nine seventy five, and so forth. So my total bond premium is fifty seven hundred and eighty eight dollars. Not a big job, all right. Subtotal again. This there's the cost as kicked out by the Excel spreadsheet automatically. But you remember those list of bid items, they had estimated quantities, remember? So for this example, the Mobin demote is to quantity of two in and out. On the asphalt, they, they told us it's 150 tons and 800 yards of backfill, 4,000 square feet of sidewalk, and eight light poles. 
So the next column is we take the total cost and the spreadsheet divides by the paid quantity. Two, divide 39,000 by 150, divide 34,000 by 800, divide 59,000 by 4,000, et cetera. And we come up with unit price. And that's what's gonna go in the bid form under the unit price for that item. But these are exact, absolutely exact. However, at, at the city hall, our bid runner is sitting there in the lobby with a cell phone talking to our chief estimator and they have to write down all these numbers. So the more numbers they have to write, the more hectic the process becomes. And you're in a lobby with three, four, five, six, seven other primes bid runners also. All of them have clipboards with their bid form and their manila envelope getting ready to fill in the blanks. So we, what we do, and which a lot of generals do, most generals, is we take the theoretical around amount and we round it to an even easy, a more even number. And we call it the as bid unit. So this column is a manual entry. So the 20,922, we change it to 925. 266 remains that. The $43, so we change it to 4280. And the 1485 we left alone, and the 7705 we left alone. And then the ASVID extension, and, and we on our decimal point setting, we, we don't want any decimal points. I give a grand total of this and see if my rounding came up or down significantly, 237.030 versus the true as calculated by Excel, 237, 300, a couple hundred bucks, not a big deal, we'll just call it good. So therefore now we have, and this is the number, these, this is what the bid runner fills out on the bid form. Licks the envelope, turns it in and hope for the best. That's how we utilize the unit price method for most heavy civil and public works contracts. So I'll stop right there for the moment and see if you have any questions on that. Yeah, uh, we have one question. Nisha is asking, should I send the scope letter to every prime? Ed, did you hear that? Yes, I did. Uh, what? Uh, I said. That, that's, the, that's the extent of the question. I, I, if you can pick an interpretation and go with it. Yeah, you, you, you know, un unless you happen to know one or two primes on that list that you don't like or you don't want to do work with because you've done work with before and it's not been a good experience, you are not obligated to bid to every prime. But if you have no objections to it, then you need to, then you should be sending a scope letter to every one of them because you don't know which one of them is going to be low. And you, the fewer primes you, you bid to, the less chances you are going to be competitive and likely to be the low bidder on your particular trade. Remember, in public works per the California Public Contract Code, it is not about what a great company you are and what your certifications are. It's all about the money. You're either low or you're not. And if you're a prime, you are. There is no, there is no second place finish. You have to be low and, and, and comply with all provisions of the bid proposal requirements. 
but they're looking for the for the cheapest price. That's the way it's done in public works. Uh, we have another question here in the chat. Roshan is asking, what's the average percentage you can use for general cost and other categories that you spoke of? Well, you, if you mean general conditions, uh, the general conditions, the average that they run is a low of 6% on the larger jobs and 10% on the smaller jobs because you still have a, a significant amount of effort and expense on a small project, whereas on a big project, it's going to be just a little more, but you know, mathematically, it becomes a, a, a lower ratio. Um, but you should not be using the percentage to determine your cost, your general conditions cost. You should be doing the spreadsheet and price every one of those items out. It, it doesn't take that long to do it. And as far as um, what other percentages are you talking about? Uh, if you're talking about fee markup, what should you put on it? That's something that I cannot tell you because every contractor has their own li lower limit that they that they will accept. You know, I have many, many subcontractors that tell me I'm not going to take a job unless I can make 30, 35, 40 percent. Well, good for you. I'm glad. I, I hope you get that. As a as a prime, there's no way I can mark up, mark up a job 35 or 40 percent and never land a job. That's just not the market for the primes. But then again, we're dealing with the larger numbers. So for subcontractors, the good news for you guys is that you can mark up a higher amount percentage wise than I can. But what should that amount be? Well, I guess if I could give you a lower rate. I don't think anybody should be doing any work less than 20% markup. That's, by the way, that's profit and overhead. And I know many, many electricians that mark up their, their bid proposals 25, 30, 35%. As I said, 50% of successful estimating is skill, not the math. And that skill involves reading the market. You know, well, how much can I get? How much can I make? How much can I put on my bid and still get the job? It varies. It varies on a million things. Who you're competing against, what type of project it is, um, what's the position of your company? I mean, for those of us that, are, that have been in the business long enough, we, we all have different thresholds of pain and different thresholds of, of uh, what it should be and what, what we're willing to do. Uh, we've, we've, we've wound up bidding on jobs and as we're approaching the hour, say a quarter to two, and uh, I'm getting bids from my subcontractors and, and for those of subs that know us and work with us, the more friendly ones that we have a relation with, you might say, hey, Ed, did you know that you're the only guy bidding on this job? Really? No, I didn't know that because I have no way of knowing how you know who's who's ultimately going to turn in the bid, and uh, or my bid runner can show up at City Hall and they'll say, you know what, Ed, there's no one else here. We're the only people here. Well, that doesn't mean that somebody you can turn in their their envelope early, but the odds are that we are the low the only bidder or maybe one of only one or three bidders. That being the case, I might take a gamble and put another five or 10% on my bid before I finalize, because what the heck? If, I, if I'm the only bidder, then I can, perhaps I can get more. <coughs> Pardon me. That's a theoretical case. I can tell you every general has done that and every general has probably a 50-50% win rate where it, it turned out well for us or it didn't turn out well for us. It's, 
It's a gut feeling. Hope that answered the question. Yeah, great, thanks. We have a request for a clarification from Nisha here. Um, why wait until the day of the bid to input the numbers? Uh, why not go in with their, in there with the numbers already? That's a great question. And that tells me that you don't know how the work, how this industry works. The reason we do the bids up to the last minute is because all the subcontractors are deathly afraid that their bid is going to be shot. So they purposely hold their numbers back until the very last minute. But what am I talking about? All right. Those of you who have done residential construction, you know that it's almost uh, standard operating procedure that you go to the homeowner and say, uh, I'm here to give you a price on your painting your house. So you walk in, you take measurements, you take photos, you do some calculations, you go back to your office and you put to type together a nice proposal, very, very accurate and very competitive. And you give that, that homeowner the bid for $10,000. Eight times out of 10, that owner in the interest of, I wanna get the best price, they take that bid proposal of yours and they show it to another painter and say, I've got a number for 10 grand, can you beat it? Well, hell yes, you can beat it. I'll do it for $9,800. That owner just shopped your bid, okay? There are crimes out there that will take your bid and shop it. We do not do that. And most of my friends that I know don't do that, but there are generals that will do that. The result is we all get penalized for it. So in order to play it safe, the subcontractors wait to the last minute to turn in their bid. Therefore, there is no such thing as turning in your bid early in public works. All right, great. Thanks. Nisha's uh, saying thank you. Thanks, Nisha. Very informative. All right, we don't have any more questions here. Okay, well, um... yeah, you want to go back to the slides? Yeah. So, I need to do this. That's going to get it from the beginning. Oh, okay. Wait a Yeah, we, we had arranged it so um, we had some upcoming bids, but I, I don't know if Tiffany uh, already spoke to those in the beginning to her satisfaction. Um, but Tiffany, are you still there? Tiffany, you want to interject anything at this point? I'm here. No, I don't have anything else to add. This was great. I learned a lot. Um, and I'm looking forward to partnering on future uh, workshops. Also, uh, well, I, yeah, I'd like to put in my bid for suggesting that we in the future uh, at your, you know, at your convenience, we do one on project management because this is just the first part of learning how to bid, preparing an estimate, and then what happens if you get a job? Yes, that is, that was our, that is our plan to do part two, um, and we can work out the date, but I, I second that request to do a project management workshop also. Very important. All right, I'm gonna drop a, a link in the chat here. Just to let us know what you thought of today's webinar. Um, and you can fill that out right now or save it for later. It just takes a couple minutes. Um, I mean, even if that, you can do it anonymously in a minute. Um, and we hope to see you at future webinars. On that note, uh, on October 13th, I'll be giving a how to do business with the government webinar. This is one our monthly introduction to government contracting webinar. You can find the hyperlink there. Um, these are all on our calendar. As soon as we have events finalized for uh, description, title, and things like that, we put them up on our calendar. 
And this one's not quite ready yet, but we will be having a marketing to the government webinar um, that's gonna touch on capability statements and other things about how to market your business, different levels of the government. And that's gonna be on Tuesday, October 25th at 11 a.m. So please do take a look at uh, for those coming up. Let's see if we have any more questions. I don't see anything. So let's just go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks so much again, uh, Tiffany. And, and, and of course, Ed, that was tremendously informative and uh, I think we all got a lot out of it. So thank you so much for your time. I um, just wanna note that we, we can share the slides, the video, as well as the sample documents uh, when we get all of those uh, ready to put on our website for tomorrow. So hope to see you at future webinars. Yeah, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to type, type in my email address. These, uh, those Excel spreadsheets are, uh, anybody uh, who wants them is uh, simply contact me and, yeah, and Ed, send it. We'll, we'll distribute them um, to everyone, Ed. Yeah. So you, don't, you don't need to worry about it if you don't want. All right, and if you're interested in being a client for NorCal PTAC, um, best thing is to go to our website and apply directly from there. I'll just drop that link in the chat as well. Uh, if you reach out directly to your procurement specialist, they're just gonna route you back to the website. So uh, please sign up on our website if you're interested and uh, you can have a session with that if you're in the construction industry. So thanks everyone for coming and hope to see you at the next one. Thank you, James. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you both. Bye-bye.